And now for something completely different. Ah! Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. Signs of financial instability have shown up in the markets and the Bank of England this morning responding by restarting quantitative easing. And of course, uh, QE is now back in vogue, at least in, 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 in uh, England right now, because the Bank of England doing this. Of course, the question now becomes is how long does this take before this kind of starts to circulate back into the rest of the central banks around the, around the world, particularly as financial instability has begun to kind of peak up here a bit. You know, we've talked about here recently, the market now very oversold for the year, more than three standard deviations below the moving average, going and retesting back to these intraday lows that we had back in June, holding on to that. This morning, futures were pointing substantially lower. Those are starting to recover on this news from Bank of England, of course, and uh, kind of giving markets hope that maybe the Fed's gonna back off of their more aggressive rate hike stance now that already we're seeing some signs of financial instability in different places. You know, one of the things that we've talked about that's really creating more financial instability pretty much than anywhere else right now is that dollar. Uh, The dollar continues to surge here, money being dragged into the U.S. because of higher rates and and liquidity. Um, That that index now very extended above the 50-day moving average. And again, uh, just that is adding to that additional tightening of financial conditions in the market overall. So you know, this is this is providing more of that kind of downside pressure on equity prices as that dollar strengthens. Again, as we talked about before, so much of corporate profitability and revenues depend on international sales. That stronger dollar is not only impacting corporate revenues, but it's also a, a contributing to that financial tightening and financial conditions abroad because of that additional input of a strong dollar. Uh, particularly in the commodity space, trade, et cetera, on those countries. So again, this is this is starting to cause that financial instability that we're talking about. Now, we haven't seen it show up um, just yet, but we are starting to see it show up in the U.S. in terms of credit spreads are starting to rise. Now, they're not blowing out yet, but they are have certainly increased here as of late. High yield is now actually being back to high yield as people are having to pay up for premium on junk bonds. But also, if we take a look at the volatility index as well, finally, we're starting to see some action there. Uh, The volatility index has has finally broken above 30, uh, starting to actually show a bit of increase. Again, now the volatility index is very extended above its moving averages as well. And and the reason these extensions uh, are important is because they do show potentially a sign of a reversal. So, you know, if we go back and look at the S&P 500 as an example, we've talked about yesterday you know, markets are very oversold. Bearishness is now at a record level. We actually have more bearishness now. Even though the markets are at the same level they were back in June, we now have a record level of bearishness, even more bearishness than we had back at the June lows. Of course, that was that contributing factor that gave us that bit of a rally uh, going into July and August. So again, as we talked about over the last couple of days, I was on Charles Payne yesterday on Fox Business talking about the same thing is that we're v- so very oversold here. You're going to be set up for a bit of a rally. All you knew- need is really is a, is a bit of news uh, to help do that, or actually even just at this point, the lack of news. Uh, Yesterday, markets were doing okay in the morning until James Bullard from the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank came out and reiterated the more hawkish stance on the Fed hiking rates to the moon to combat inflation. Uh, It's great rhetoric. They're never going to get that far. They're going to break something before they get there. But again, this is if, if we get a point to where the markets can just get either a lack of news or just a bit of good news, better economic news, slower rate of inflation, something like that, uh, could see a fairly substantial rally here. Uh, again, our target there at 3,900 to 4,000 on the S&P. And simply just because you've got so, much, so many people off sides now, record short positions, record put options. If the market starts to run, uh, people will start having to close those positions out. That adds fuel to the fire, and that's how you get these reversal rallies in the markets. And again, we've had a very long sell-off here, seven straight days <clears throat> You know, right now uh, to the downside if today finishes negative. Um, that'll be the seventh day of negative declines, and that is a very long stretch by nature of having seven consecutive days Uh, of a decline. Also, just looking at this year, talking about negative days, 
We've had more negative days in the market this year than we've had in any other bear market or actually any other market period on an annual basis going back to 1974. So you have to go back to the 1974 bear market to find another year with as many negative days contained in it as we have just year to date right now. So if this market kind of continues, we'll set a new record for negative days in a given year. And that just kind of really tells you just how challenging this year has been. Um, it's just been a really tough year so far. Markets are really not down that much. Yes, they're down about 23% year to date. But given the fact that you have this many negative days, you would expect the markets to be down a whole lot more um, than that. But that just really kind of just shows you how, you know, what a drag this year has been, so to speak. It's just, you know, after 2020 and 2021, where markets just went straight up, you could do no wrong. Now you've got a year where nothing seems to go right. But that's what we've talked about before, importantly, is to, you know, make sure and, and, you know, set your parameters for viewing your performance, not just from January the 1st to wherever you are. That's a terrible way to look at your portfolio. Go back to where you were in 2019, 2020. Look at your returns on, you know, a basis since then so that you strip out this kind of idea of pegging everything, anchoring you know, the peak prices in the markets. You know, look at your longer term trend of your portfolio. How are you doing overall? Are you still tracking towards your goals? Uh, this is something we'll talk about more today with Danny Ratliff when he joins me as well. Because again, you know, these anchoring points that we do, that leads us to make even more investing mistakes. <laughs> so again, that's the thing we want to try to avoid. Um, oil prices also, interestingly enough, um, very oversold here. And again, we've talked about before heading into winter. Uh, of course, lots of energy problems in Europe. The U.S. now being blamed for, for blowing up Nord Stream uh, 1 and 2 pipelines. <laughs> well, you know, we'll see how that works out. But again, uh, oil price is very oversold here. So again, like the markets, we could see a reversal in energy prices. What would benefit a, a surge in energy prices would be a declining dollar. Uh, the strength of the dollar that we've had has really what broke that rally that we had going back into June of this year. Um, and since then, as that dollar has strengthened, that's really taken the wind out of the cell of oil prices. But that's because oil prices, gold prices, all that are traded in dollars internationally. So the more, the stronger the dollar is, the less demand you have, that brings these oil prices down. So again, a reversal in the dollar, that's going to benefit asset prices like stocks. It's also going to bring oil prices up, commodities as well. Gold should perform better. Also, gold uh, has been a, a, a laggard this year despite raging inflation you know this is the the one aspect that everybody's talking about is like well you got to own gold you know the world's going to go in the crapper and and we're going to have raging inflation you should own gold it's a hedge but it's been a terrible hedge for inflation this year um you know gold bugs are still hanging in there it's like you know someday that gold's going to come back um gold is very very oversold here uh, should see a rally between 1680 and 1700 on gold. That'd probably be a good place to lift exposure out of your portfolio if we get back to 1700. Um, eventually, gold will start to pro perform better. But what we need to see there for gold to actually be a, a much better performing play is real yields. So once real yields get back into positive territory, gold should start to perform better. But as long as real yields remain negative as they are now, that's what that's been the big driver. Both the strong dollar and negative real yields has been the driver for these lower gold prices. So again, uh, a lot of stuff to get into this morning. Five places to put your cash if you're looking for that. Um, also more about investing and looking at your returns over time. Coming up with Danny Ratliff right here on this morning's edition of The Real Investment Show. Get by the website, our latest blog post is out as well from Michael Leibowitz. It's up on the post now, realinvestmentadvice.com. Be right back. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. If your portfolio looks more like a horror show, you won't want to miss our next Candid Coffee on dealing with bloody markets. No tricks, just treats. From Richard Rosso and Danny Radcliffe with some not-so-spooky ideas to budgeting and how to maximize your cash. Don't be spooked by markets or Danny's bathroom. On our next Candid Coffee, Saturday, October 1st. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Candid Coffee with Radcliffe and Rosso. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. 
Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN, or again, simply online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, Another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. Welcome back to the show this morning. I'm Real Science Roberts. Danny Ratliff joining me as well um, as we kind of get into this uh, hump day edition. A few things to really kind of, uh, you know, kind of get through this morning as I was just talking about a second ago. One of the, the big challenges that investors face, and again, when you start talking about the fact that, you know, this year's been tough. I mean, it's just been a tough year in the markets, no matter where, where you go, you know, everything is kind of not working. Bonds aren't working. Stocks aren't working. Nothing's really kind of working. Um, you know, and again, we talk about, you know, one of the big psychological problems that investors face is anchoring to a specific point. And, and we have, a, you know, this is, you know, how markets have trained people um, and the financial media has trained people to look at things because when you get distressed, this is where you start making decisions to, to start making changes to your portfolio, right? So you start selling stuff. And there's an interesting chart out this morning. Millennials are the biggest sellers and buyers of stock this year. So millennials are trading stocks more than anybody else this year by a large margin. So they're buying and selling and buying and selling and buying and selling and, 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 and moving all around. So again, you know, that, you know, typically doesn't work out well uh, for investors by doing that. Um, but this is because we're all anchoring to a certain point. And what Wall Street wants you to do is Wall Street wants you to change things because money in motion creates fees and commissions. So, you know, well, I don't pay any trading commissions. Well, you do. You just don't see it because it's through payment for order flow. And by the way, the SEC was looking at potentially banning payment for order flow because it's very unfair to retail customers who get the shaft on the other end of this for for you know unfair pricing, but as you would as you would expect, the SEC has given in to Wall Street and said, okay, we won't ban it. So, so you know, Wall Street wins again because they have better lobbies than retail investors do. Um, but you know, the problem is is that we train investors to look at things on on you know where were you at the beginning, beginning of this year, where are you now, and oh my gosh, you need to make a change. One of the things you need to start doing is looking at the performance of your portfolio over a longer period of time, you know, two years, three years. Um, and if you do that, A, it strips out the volatility of the market so that you can get a better picture about what your performance is actually doing, what your portfolio is actually doing. But more importantly, it gives you a better indication about how you're tracking towards your financial goals. And so if over a two or three year period you're not tracking towards your goals, well, then maybe you do need to make a, make a change, right? You know, you're maybe you're too one-sided in so, some portion of your portfolio. But again, stripping out, you know, and just you know, stripping out past performance only to look at current performance is always going to lead you to making more psychologically based decisions, which almost invariably always turn out wrong. And particularly when you're in a volatile market, as I said earlier, you know, this year we've got more negative days this year 
than any other year going all the way back to 1974. You got to go back to the bear market of 1974 to find more negative days uh, in a market. That's, that's a pretty incredible you know, number if you think about it, but that's how challenging this year has been so far. So again, you know, this is you know, kind of where investors are and just one thing to kind of look at. And, and this is something that Danny and Richard work a lot on with financial planning is to you know, look at goal performance, look at hurdle rates and these type of things. Um, you know, and that's been challenging this year, right, Danny? It has. You know, a lot of people say, well, how do you guys sleep at night? And, you know, number one, we don't. Um, <laughs> and, and, and look, you know, it's I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday and we were talking about, OK, well, how do you view performance? You know, we're, we're beating the benchmark fairly handedly, but it's no consolation prize. It doesn't feel good. Um, nobody likes it. Nobody likes to be down and nobody likes certain positions that are down more than others. But they're all built or, or there for certain themes or certain reasons. And I think the big picture is when we come back, and, a, and a, one of the reasons why we could sleep at night is because we can look at these plans and understand, okay, that if we had this plan that worked, we're still not off track. We assumed that we were going to have years similar to this. Now, it hasn't felt good because there really hasn't been any place to hide but cash. The other thing that helps us, I think, is that having some cash on hand, we're going to have that ability to, one, weather the storm, two, find some op opportunities in the future. And that's where I get excited. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting because you hear the, like you just mentioned, Lance, mm -hmm. that Wall Street loves you trading. And and they do. There's a really good book by Michael Lewis, Flash Boys, that, that actually documents that. So if you guys haven't read that, or actually I think there's a movie about it too, Lance, um, go check that out. But they also love the old moniker of just, hey, set it and forget it. Don't worry about it. And you know what? That's okay for some people. And, that, and that'll work. If you have a lot of time on your side, the issue is how much time are you going to have to take? And if you're in distribution mode, now you're in potential trouble. So that's why we also like cash as well, where, you know, it, we've talked about this before back in January, we were raising a little bit of cash and, you know, we're having the conversations, Lance, a lot of calls I was getting were, hey, what are we doing? We had a great year last year. Why are we, why are we raising so much cash? And, and now, unfortunately, you know, we all wish we had a whole lot more. Right. Well, and it's interesting too is that you know the the group that is supposed to be doing buy and hold, um, which is, you know, a great thing for Wall Street, as you said, because you know th this is you know I've talked about this story before. You know, buy and hold didn't exist prior to about 1985, around there, and this was really where, and, and prior to 1985, there weren't many mutual funds. Danny wasn't even born yet, so I was born. <laughs> <laughs> but I prior, wasn't very old. I was <laughs> prior to 1985, there really weren't a lot of mutual funds. There was a small handful of mutual funds. And, I, you know, I wrote this article once talking about, you know, I could see the meeting in, in my head, you know, at Merrill Lynch back in the day or, or wherever it was. You know, some guy walks in to, to Merrill Lynch and says, hey, I've got this great idea. Let's create a whole bunch of these mutual funds. This mutual fund thing's kind of interesting. We create a whole bunch of mutual funds and we just convince people to stick their money into a mutual fund and just keep dollar cost averaging into that mutual fund every year and buy and hold and never sell it, right? We just annuitize our business. We just collect fees every year. And, and the more money we put into these mutual funds, the more fees we collect. And we can get rid of this commission trading, which is very volatile. You know, when markets are going up, we do great on commission trading. When they go down, so people stop trading. And, and, and you know, this fee-based business is so much better because I don't have to worry about that. And, and, and Merrill Lynch goes, this is a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was really when mutual funds exploded. And, and beginning in 1990 and 2000, uh, we started promoting this idea of just buy and hold investing. And, and what's interesting is, is that we've prom been promoting and building this whole idea of buy and hold investing. And yet millennials, the one group that are supposed to be the buy and holders, are the ones that are trading more than everybody else right now. Well, and, so, and, and we were seeing a lot more trading because the access to it. We've talked about this yeah. where, you know, we go way back in time. It was more buy and hold prior to that yep. from an individual stock perspective because you had to get information from the newspaper. I mean, I, I had clients still even 10, 15 years ago that were documenting it in, a, in an old yep. charting book, and they would chart each one of their positions. And you'd get it from the Wall Street Journal or the you know whatever news outlet you may get the paper from, and you didn't have the accessibility to sit, sit there and say, well, shoot, I'm going to go ahead and line up a trade, get everything ready. And so I think the accessibility's changed things a little bit as well. No, it's changed a lot. The average holding period back in that that era that you're talking about, back in the 80s and 90s, your average hold time was almost six years for stock. Because again, you know, you didn't well, you didn't have stock volatility like you had today either. Because you know, if a company missed earnings by a penny, 
by the time you found out about it, it was three days later, <laughs> you know. That's right. And so people were making these big emotional decisions over a penny. It's not seconds later. Yeah, yeah. It's and and one of the I think one of the worst things we did to the market was you know um, this this SEC rule that we had to have this immediacy of information as soon as the company released it, it had to be released to everybody at the same time. And I'm not sure that was such a great thing before it went through analyst. Analysts would do the work on it and say, yeah, you know, you know, IBM missed by a penny, but you know, Outlook was good, and and it's just a, you know, it's just a penny, right? Is it? And and now a company misses by a penny and it clips twenty billion dollars worth of market cap off their off their stock. You know, it's just it's just gotten so exacerbated because of all this. To your point, all this access to information, the ability to trade on the notice, you don't even think about it now. It's like, oh my gosh, stock's going down, I'm gonna sell it. Um, you know, and we don't think through the process. And so now the average holding period time is less than five months. It's actually approaching four months right now is the average holding time for a stock or a position. So, you know, you know, long-term investing really isn't long-term investing anymore. No, it's not. And so I, I think this is where you have to be careful. So, so let's just take a look back a little bit. So 11 of the last 47 years have been negative. 11, okay? Now, granted, when they're negative, they can, they can be, be pretty really substantial, negative. right? <laughs> and that's why they call them bear markets, but they also don't last that long. Yeah. And so where bull markets have a tendency to run much longer. Now, we've been talking about this for quite some time. Look, we've had extended prices for, well, I mean, we can go back for a very long time on that. And, and look, if we want to rationalize, so here's, I think, the biggest problem I think people are making at the moment. And, and that I'm hearing is that, look, I got all the way out. Okay, great. Look, I know I can get back in. Okay. Uh, you know, we hear this often. And that's yeah, why, yeah. you know, it, it, but here's the kicker is that, you're rationalizing and you're thinking, okay, these things have happened. They've already occurred. And I think it's only going to get worse or it's going to continue. But this market's going to run up before you find out that we're out of a recession. Things this will mar- change. This market will run up before you even find out we're in a recession. That's true. Yeah. I mean, which we before, saw a yeah. month ago. Yep. Yeah. So this is where you have to be cautious. And it's easy to make these rash or extreme decisions very quickly because, look, and I get it. This is your livelihood. It's your security. You've worked hard your whole life for these funds. And you don't want to see them just deplete. And you also understand that this is what you're relying on. And, and, you know, I think men, we talk about often that, you know, especially as we feel like a lot of times the breadwinners are the head of the household. And you think, oh, my gosh, I, I mean, this is going to be devastating. What am I going to tell my wife? What are we going to do with the kids? I mean, we can't sit in the college. I mean, this is how mm-hmm. substantial this is to some households and families. And so don't make that rash decision, though. This is why I think it's it's always good to have that plan in place Say, hey, look, we're moving out. We're going to wait. You know, we've talked about moving out. We've, we have clients we're looking on board now that's been difficult because of this environment. And we're saying, hey, guys, we're going to wait for a better opportunity. Well, and that kind of brings up, you know, lately we've been buying a lot of short-dated treasuries. We've been buying short, short-dated bond ETFs to, to hold cash, get a better yield. Um, 29% of Americans are now drawing more from their savings uh, than usual. Um, this was due to a recent survey. And the question is, is why are they doing that? More importantly, where five areas that you can put cash right now that are some options. We'll talk about all that when we come back from the break with Danny Ratliff. Don't go away. The Real Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. If your portfolio looks more like a horror show, you won't want to miss our next Candid Coffee on dealing with bloody markets. No tricks, just treats. From Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff with some not-so-spooky ideas to budgeting and how to maximize your cash. Don't be spooked by markets or Danny's bathroom. On our next Candid Coffee, Saturday, October 1st. Register now now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Candid Coffee with Ratliff and Rosso. (laughs) Realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. 
And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. Who needs to send stuff overnight? That's stupid. Put stuff in the envelope, you give it to the mailbox, it gets there in a couple of days, you know, whatever. It's fine. You don't need to get stuff up there literally overnight. I mean, who needs to have stuff that quick? The Real Investment Show podcast. Same show, your schedule. I'm waiting for Amazon Prime to start becoming pre-prime, which is, I just want to be able to think about it, and then it shows up. At realinvestmentadvice.com. And bill somebody else for it. <laughs> Anyone can sell you insurance, and they'll gladly take your premium dollars. The RIA Insurance Agency can provide you with insurance solutions tailor-made for your needs and lifestyle. Because everyone's assets are different, let RIA Insurance review what you need to protect and how. We won't sell you insurance, but what you need will be a matter of policy. RIA Insurance Agency. 888-915-0780. 888-915-0780. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Click on the insurance tab. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at Stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. If your portfolio looks more like a horror show, you won't want to miss our next Candid Coffee on dealing with volatile markets. From Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff, Saturday, October 1st. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Candid Coffee with Ratliff and Rosso. Realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. You can back up a little bit, Brent. Uh, <laughs> I lowered my computer monitor for you. <laughs> there we go. Hello. Much better. Much better. Much better. Anyway, <clears throat> welcome back to the show this morning. Danny Ratliff joining me. 29% uh, of Americans now drawing from their savings, which is more than usual. Interesting story out, a uh, survey by um, the Consumer Confidence Weekly Tracker. And, and, and what's important about this is that, <clears throat> you know, there's been a lot of talk about how healthy the consumer is, right? You look at debt to income ratios, these type of things. And, and we've talked about this before is that the problem with all these ratios is they're heavily skewed by the top 10% of income earners. So, you know, as we start, you know, trying to look at this data, it's like, oh, well, the household looks incredibly strong. And even the Federal Reserve has made mention of this is that employment's strong, the household balance sheet is strong, you know, everything's fine. So we can hike rates and it's not going to cause any problems. Um, you know, but the reality is, is that the, the average household isn't that strong. All these debt to income ratios and, and all those ratios as such is that you look at anything that measures uh, any type of, of balance sheet item to net worth or income or wages, that's heavily skewed by the top 10 percent of income earners. You know, we've talked about this before with 401k plans every year. Fidelity comes out with this report and they say we have more 401k millionaires than ever and it's like wow that sounds really good people are doing great their 401k plans now that number is going to go down this year um but you know we look at that every year and 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 what they don't tell you is is that they say we had 137,000 millionaires in their 401k plan you know awesome right but they don't tell they what's what's the number of those 401k millionaires relative to all the 401k plans they manage it's about 1%. Right? 
So once you look at that and you go, oh, well, yeah, it's it's, it's the top 1%. And, and it's the same thing for all these things. Who has the most savings, right? Top 10% of income earners. Who owns 90% of the stock market? Top 10% of income earners. The rest of everybody's just trying to make ends meet for the most part. And by the way, if, if you're not struggling and making ends meet right now, you're probably in the top 10% of income earners, just FYI. <laughs> so, you know, just make you feel better about yourself this morning going to work. If you're listening to a financial talk show, which nobody listens to, um, you're probably in the top 10% of income earners because you have money invested. Um, but here's the thing. I mean, uh, we should be talking about the Kardashians. They're now moving to Hulu because nobody else wanted them. So <laughs> they're, they're trying to remain relevant. <laughs> they were running a commercial yesterday. We're back. And everybody goes, who cares? <laughs> you're on Hulu. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, anyway, just joking. Um, so anyway, the survey out, 29% of people now drawing uh, more from their savings, which is more than usual. Um, and, and again, you know, one of the interesting parts about this is that Americans who do not report a change are, are exercising caution. Those who say they spend money, borrow money, use credit, invest, save money, and pay off their loans credit more than usual are outnumbered by those who say, they do those things less than usual. So in other words, more people are taking money out of their investment accounts, out of their savings accounts. They're spending more money to make ends meet, more so than those saying less than usual. And again, when you, and, and again this isn't surprising. High inflation, weaker economic growth, all these things starting to weigh on the economy. And that's, and that's, that's problematic. But again, this isn't, uh, th these numbers really shouldn't be a surprise simply because, you know, if you take a look at the financial kind of net worth and, and, and net financial stability of households in that bottom 80%, it's actually a pretty dire picture. Yeah, it is. And so we start talking about credit card usage as well. That That's actually increasing substantially. If we look at it just from a year ago, or yeah, actually at the very beginning of this year, it was about $5,200 was the average credit balance. It's about $1,000 more now. Mm -hmm. We're seeing from the beginning of the year just credit card balances in general and aggregate, there's like a $46 billion difference. Now, we're still not at the highs that we had back in 2019. I think the pandemic, free money, not having to pay your bills, your rent, that's probably pretty helpful. But um, now we're beginning to see not only are people pulling from other areas, credit card usage is going up, all signs that are pointing towards, hey, people are beginning to struggle with higher interest rates, with inflation. And, you know, obviously we're beginning to see that overturn in the markets. Uh, I've got a friend, I was telling a story, Lance, um, she runs a, a title company. She's like, I've never been able to take vacation. I'm taking vacation now. Like mm -hmm. we are so dead yeah. because, you know, the amount of transactions that are occurring right now are substantially less than what we've experienced over the last, you know, five years. Um, and I think that that's, that's, we're seeing that around, you know, with many different sectors. And this is something that's becoming more and more prevalent. And so, We've talked about how sometimes a recession can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And this is probably part of what's happening now. You know, not only do we see CEO, CFO sentiment is down, uh, small businesses sentiments down, and just your average consumer because they're seeing how much it costs just to do your day-to-day -day activities. And, you know, it's uh, I think people are struggling with it. Oh, yeah. No, it, it's look, it's, it's always the case. And it, was a, it was interesting, you know, kind of, you know, story that was coming in this morning. I was listening to the radio and, and they were talking about uh, suburban housewives. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not sure that's a fair term anymore because I, I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't know. I don't personally know that many stay at home wives anymore. I mean, most of them are working, right? I mean, I know a lot of two income households. I, right? I know a lot of stay at home wives, and, and I'm going to use that term very loosely. Yeah. But they all have a side gig or they're doing something yeah. to bring some income in, right? Yeah. I'm just saying it's like, you know, the number of households that are two income households now is dramatically higher than it used to be. They're all, right? they're all bloggers, influencers. <laughs> exactly. I'm kidding. But it was an interesting story. Don't they, stab they, me. Right. No, the, it was an interesting. But no, the survey was they had surveyed all of these suburban housewives. Yeah. And this was a survey that was put out. And they were talking about the midterm elections coming up and that, you know, out of this survey, they were ranking, you know, kind of what was the most important items, right, that, that these suburban housewives would be voting on come this midterm election cycle. And what was interesting is, is the things that you hear about in the media, abortion, those type of things, those were at the very bottom of the list. At the top of the list was making ends meet, inflation, economic growth, job security, yeah. 
And in other words, not surprisingly, what suburban housewives are, are more concerned about is the security of their home, right? And, 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 and their lifestyle. Right. And, and, you know, job security. And it comes down to the old, uh, you know, Bushism. It's the economy, stupid. Right. Yeah. And, and and it was interesting because that's really where everybody is, is, is focused. And particularly that, again, going back to that bottom 80 percent of households, there's not a lot of wiggle room. You know, I run this this um, chart every now and then called the consumer savings gap, which measures the difference between the inflation adjusted cost of living going back to 1965 versus savings, wages, and credit card debt. So in other words, the, the question is, and what this, what this chart is measuring, is do you have enough savings and income to sustain your cost of living, or are you having to go into debt to maintain that, that cost of living? And what's interesting is, is that number was positive, right? So in other words, you could sustain your standard of living with just your income and savings all the way through early 2000. Beginning in 2000, though, as the Federal Reserve became this interventionist you know, behemoth in the financial markets and the economy, that was no longer the case. And now it requires almost $6,000 a year in new debt. And this kind of goes along with what Danny was just saying, uh, the increases in credit card debt. It requires almost $6,000 a year in new credit card debt plus your savings, plus your wages, just to maintain your standard of living. So, you know, that and that, so it's not surprising that when there's small changes to the economy, either through inflation, higher prices, slower economic growth, unemployment, those type of things, it impacts a very large chunk of the population very quickly. Yeah, I mean, just look at look at what's going on in the home market, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about mortgages. Those are at, at all-time lows. I think refinances are 22-year lows. I mean, this yeah. is a whole, whole sector and, and of jobs that are just hurting. Yep. And so I don't imagine, like, I don't think that's showing up in those numbers yet. What happens there? Yeah. And, and what not, that tide could change very quickly. I mean, you talked earlier about uh, Bank of England's actually capitulating to some extent, um, not going to continue to um, sell the guilt. They're, they're buying more now, right? Is that? Uh, well, yeah, they're not going to sell the guilt. They're actually going to start buying bonds. Here's the headline this morning. Bank of England capitulates, restarts QE, quantitative easing, due to significant dysfunction in their bond market, material risk to financial stability. And this is something I've been arguing with Mike Leibowitz now for the last month or so is, you know, Mike Leibowitz is like, oh, the Fed's just going to hang in there and keep fighting inflation regardless of what happens. And I'm like, they're going to keep fighting inflation until you have market instability. And this just goes to show you it didn't take very much for the Bank of England to reverse course. Uh, they just hiked interest rates. They've been doing quantitative tightening. And it didn't take much market instability for them to reverse for course very quickly because, again, what's worse than inflation? Market instability. And if you have financial instability that's starting to cause a credit crisis, that's much more dangerous to the economy than inflation. So inflation is one thing, right? But inflation will cure itself. High prices is the cure for high prices. If you do nothing, inflation will go away. Uh, it's just a function of supply and demand. But when you have financial instability, that is a much bigger problem. And that affects something that necessarily could get so bad that you could wind up in a depression. So again, if you have two, two, two fights to fight, inflation or financial instability, you will always fight financial instability because that's what gets you in a depression. Inflation won't. Then you won't worry about inflation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And financial instability will cure your inflation. Don't worry. We, we killed that inflation, though, guys. You're, <laughs> You're good. in a depression. But you can't but, pay for anything anyway. Exactly. All right. Can we come back? Uh, a lot of people asking, where can I just put some cash right now? We've got answers for you. Five areas to put cash. Talk about that when we come back from the break. Don't go away. daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. 
If your portfolio looks more like a horror show, you won't want to miss our next Candid Coffee on dealing with bloody markets. No tricks, just treats. From Richard Rosso and Danny Ratliff with some not-so-spooky ideas to budgeting and how to maximize your cash. Don't be spooked by markets or Danny's bathroom. On our next Candid Coffee, Saturday, October 1st. Register now at realinvestmentadvice.com. Candid Coffee with Ratliff and Rosso. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. So, one of the uh, questions we're getting a lot right now is like, I have cash, what should I do with it? And there was an interesting article out on Yahoo Finance this morning talking about five places to put cash. And I, I, I thought this was interesting because, you know, it's depends on who you are, right? And they actually make some pretty decent kind of comments. A um, couple of the ideas aren't great. And so we'll explain, you know, kind of quickly touch on these and explain, you know, what's good, what's not. But the first one was paying off debt. Um, if you've got a lot of credit card debt, and you know, moving into a recession next year, uh, the risk of job losses become a lot higher. Um, taking cash and paying off debt's a really great idea. Um, you know, now I'm not talking about mortgage debt. If your mortgage, this is something we've talked about before. You know, if your mortgage is two or three percent, three and a half percent, don't pay off your mortgage. That's cheap money, right? If you can borrow money for thirty years at three and a half percent, whatever. That's cheap money. Use the bank's money at that rate. That's just crazy. Invest, and if that's the only debt you have, that's fine. Just invest your money, and and you can make a bigger spread over over the mortgage over the long term. So, you know, it, it's it's you know free actually technically free money down the road, right? So, uh, and furthermore, putting a lot of your cash to work in your house, paying off your mortgage, that's fine. You don't have a mortgage payment, but now that cash is dead, right? It's not going to earn you anything. It's not going to create an income for you. And if that's the house you're going to die in, then basically you've just buried money in the backyard. Well, not because- only that, but you, your liquidity, if you're in a, if you're in a bind, yeah. your liquidity is completely gone. And now if you're out of a job, you can't go get that home equity loan and go refinance and yeah, do no- a cash out because nobody's going to give it to you. You don't have income. <laughs> exactly. So I'd rather you have cash in hand in that environment yeah. than go and, and, and freeze that up. And so, you know, Richard has a really good analogy with that. It's like basically you're turning water into ice. Mm-hmm. And you know it's it's liquid. You can you can drink from it. You can do the things you want with it. But when it's ice, you're gonna have to wait. How long do you have to wait? Depends yeah, on the right. environment. Yeah, exactly. And so so, but again, credit card debt, those type of things, absolutely great idea. Pay that stuff off. Um, you know, the other side of this, of course, is you know, you know, the question right now is that money market accounts are finally actually providing some yield. So you know, before you know, we're so used to this idea that money markets pay zero that there's a lot of people just kind of in a panic. I was like, oh, you know, you know, treasury yields are 3%. I'm going to go put all my money into treasuries. 
did you have to check your money market account? Because money markets, uh, like for instance, is Fidelity, are yielding over 2% right now. Um, so money actually in liquid cash is actually yielding something now. So before you go jumping around and making these investment decisions based on emotion, you know, check your money market rate. And if your money market rate at your bank isn't paying you anything, there's a lot of online accounts right now that are yielding two, two and a half or more percent. So you can move money into an FDIC insured money market account online, Synchrony Bank, others are providing some some pretty decent yields yep. if your bank's not giving you anything. Hey, and don't and don't listen to the 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 uh, I'm not even gonna say what I want to say. Don't <laughs> don't listen to the junk of hey, cash is trash. You can't have any cash. Look, it's okay. It's great to weather a storm if you can you can have some in this in in a savings account if you can use some of these other ideas to put funds aside. Very strategically, I think this can be a great place to be and to weather the storm in this environment. Mm -hmm. You don't have to now all or nothing, that's that's not great. Cash forever, that's not good either. And that's what we talk about often yep. is that we have clients that were still coming or people coming to us saying, hey, guys, we've been out since 08 or 09, and we need to get back in. Well, now they're probably back out. Yeah. And, and so that that is not good when you're out for a, that long of a period. But if it's for a period of time, it's for an obje objective, you have a goal in mind, great. Yeah, the, the, just having cash, even at zero, um, you know, everybody's like, well, I'm losing money to inflation. No, you're not losing money to inflation in over a few months or a year, right? Uh, to, to Danny's point, you know, if you're out for 10 years, yes, you lose money to inflation. But there are periods of time just holding cash. And, and again, this goes back to an article I wrote previously, and, and this is the most important consideration when you're thinking about cash. Where do I put it? You can only have three things. There, there's only three things you can have in any investment. You can have liquidity. You can have safety or you can have return. You can have, those are the three things you can have. Any investment will give you one or more of those three things, but no investment will give you all three. So for instance, if I want safety and liquidity, that's money market. But if I want safety and return, that's bonds, but I don't have liquidity. If I want return and liquidity, that's stocks, but I have no safety. So no matter what investment you look at, annuities, Annuities will give you return and they'll give you some safety, but they give you no liquidity. So, I mean, it doesn't matter what investments you pick. You can only have two of those three things. No, no investment will give you all three things. You've got to give up something. So you have to think about your cash is it's safe and it's liquid. Yeah, I'm not getting a lot of return, but it gives me opportunity. So, you know, one of the items on the list that Yahoo put out is the stock market, right? Stocks are down. Valuations are down. Stocks are a lot cheaper, yields are up. So this is time to start dollar cost averaging into the, into the market. You're a long-term investor, right? It's always funny, everybody's a long-term investor until the market turns down and then nobody's a long-term investor anymore. <laughs> Again, we get back to psychology. Yeah. But what safety and liquidity give me right now is it gives me the ability for liquidity and return later when the opportunity for stocks rise. But if I'm locked up into a, a, a CD, you know, I go to the bank, I'm just going to I'm just going to buy a five year CD and make four percent of my money. Right. Well, now you're locked up in the CD for five years and now you miss the opportunity to buy safety, uh, uh, liquidity and return in the stock market when the time is right. And so you always remember whatever you give up, there's a consequence on the other side, you know, another one that everybody's chasing right now is I bonds. You're you missed that trade. Well, I think you right. can actually still get that trade because look, no, through October, you make nine point six two percent. They're going to give it to you for the next six months. They're going to reset that rate here in a month, and then you'll get that for the following six months. And then what ideally you do with an I bond is you buy one, your spouse buys one. You can only put ten thousand yeah. dollars a piece into it. If you get a cash refund or if you get a, a tax refund, excuse me. You can actually put those funds and do, you can get a paper I bond for $5,000, but you could also gift a box them for each other. Now, this is a little bit trickier, but you could purchase for your spouse. Your spouse could purchase for you. So you could put up to $40,000 right now. Now, the kicker is you cannot gift those and then redeem them in any year that they actually buy more. Okay. The idea would be is that you're not going to be buying more in the future because rates are going to be much lower. So for a period of time, not would, a terrible thing. Right. But what's your, what's your lockup period? Well, your lockup period, you're likely looking at a one to two year period. Right. So, so if this is a so, small piece. So, so the way, look. Well, no, 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 I'm not, no, hold yeah. on a second. This is my point though, right? Safety, liquidity, return. Correct. Right? You can get return. Yep. Right? And you can get safety. Correct. But you're locked up now. Correct. So if well, the, bond, the stock market's going to bottom long before the yields, do, I mean, before uh, you come out of, of these course. bonds. 
And the problem is, is that rate, and what I mean by you missed that trade is, is the rate's now peaked. Correct. Inflation's coming down. So now that rate's going to start resetting lower. But if we can stay over the next year, you're going to average maybe 6 7%. Yeah, yeah. Not bad. So here's the kicker, right? If we build a house, do we use all the same material? No. So we want to use different different sure. things for different different times. Yeah. And so you can make an argument for cash, money markets, CDs, bonds, I bonds, stocks in this environment. I mean, I think we can we can make an argument for all of these, and you should be utilizing each of these in different ways. Now, cash, we talk about we want emergency funds, we want something for short term goals, and we want a financial vulnerability cushion. Richard and I have been talking about this for two years, <laughs> um, and but we need it in the pandemic. We need no, it now. No, nobody still wants it. <laughs> nobody wants it. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it, it is a piece of the puzzle. And so that I think is. as we're putting all these together, we need to understand how they all work. What's our time frame? Okay, so for me, if I'm thinking, okay, I've got, um, you know, I need a new vehicle, a down payment, or I'm paying taxes. Well, I can go buy a three, six-month T-bill and have those funds make a lot more money than what I can do if I'm just leaving funds in cash. So when I start, so that's how I start thinking about, you know, okay, it's a process. Where do I go next? How do, the, how do I use these funds? Longer term funds, hey, great. I think there's some buying opportunities in long term bonds. Let's go buy long term bonds. Yeah. Let's go buy equities. I understand. Look, we own a lot of companies right now that are down, but we we think that in a year or so that they're going to be much higher than where they are today. So I'm okay with holding on to some of these things, mm -hmm. but I also want to have cash on hand to go invest and buy things at cheaper prices, whether that be real estate, whether it be stocks. Any of these asset classes that we can think about. Yeah, no, absolutely. And this is and this is the and it goes back to the point though, safety liquidity return, right? Where right. Do, where where do I put my money and, and making sure that you don't lock yourself up into something. And again, this is where we're seeing a lot of people make some mistakes right now. They're running out buying two year treasuries um, or longer dated treasuries. Correct. You know, just for the I just want the yield, right? I just I'm just gonna hold this until it matures. That's great. Now you've locked yourself up into something that, you know. You know, potentially when this market does bottom, your return coming off the bottom in the stock market is going to be dramatically higher. And this is the mistake where everybody that everybody makes is they put themselves into this position going, and if I can just get four percent, I'm I'm happy. That's all I need, right? Well, I just until need the market four. makes twenty. I mean, exactly. That's, yeah, that's and, the way it goes. And then and then they're late coming back out of these items. You know, you know, trying to get out of these, you know, four percent yields to get back into the stock market. Now you've missed a big chunk of that run in the market. And so the point is, is always having this liquid, you know, liquidity is, is your friend. That's the one thing you want. And sometimes just trying to chase return isn't necessarily your best option. Uh, you know, because, again, if you have to give up liquidity, that limits your other ability for opportunity. It's, it's your opportunity cost that you give up, which actually could wind up costing you a whole lot more. But you're, you're making a really good yeah. argument for a sound financial plan. It says, yeah. hey, OK, we need X amount here. Let's start looking at putting these funds in other places. That's what it boils down to, understanding where the funds are, how you should utilize them, and what the impact is over your lifetime within the plan, right? Yeah. That's why we say it's not all or no, all or nothing strategy with, with all of these things. Oh, absolutely right. And then one of my favorite lines on this is high yield savings accounts are back. You can get two percent on a money a high yield money market account. You remember when high yield money market accounts were like eight? No, oh, so much <laughs> higher. The, actually, the, the best comment I saw on here though is that somebody in the comments says, "I invest my money in gasoline and groceries." <laughs> I thought, oh man, best return on the market. Yeah. All right, that wraps up the show for today, Danny. Thank you so much. We'll be back tomorrow with Michael Leibowitz. Uh, we've got a very deep discussion tomorrow on uh, bonds, and so we're going to go deep deep dive into bonds tomorrow with Michael Leibowitz right here on the Real Investment Show. Have a great day. Stick around. Three minutes on markets coming right up.